This is Geek Gab with your hosts, Dornall and me, Daddy Warpig. We are back, Geek Gab, for Saturday, June 13th, 2020. Uh, just a whole lot of excitement here in 2020. For those of you listening, you know, deep, deep, deep in the future who have dug up this show as part of a time capsule and are wondering what the heck happened to Western civilization. And I want to reassure you that none of us have a damn clue either. We, we, we can't help you. We don't know what the hell's happening to Western civilization either. We're just watching it in real time and shaking your heads and and just kind of kind of freaking out sometimes and, and mostly really laughing about it because that's all you can do and it feels bad i feel bad laughing about it sometimes like the seattle thing right now that's kind of serious and i get why it would be serious but at the same time it's hella funny Wow, it's also, hilarious. It's 20, 2020, because I used the word hella. <laughs> yeah, you're. Wait, hang on. You're 2001. It's hella, right? You're 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 in Utah, and you were you grew up uh, at least initially in on a base in Germany. Yes. Yet yet you have incorporated Northern Californian slang. I've incorporated all kinds of slang, man. You're That's all kind of my forward. thing is using like way out of date slang from all over the place. I could see that. I could see that. It's it's like you're you're channeling your inner boomer. No, I, I'm channeling my inner pre boomer, dude. Like, <laughs> I, I I I use slang from like the 30s and the 20s and the oh. old west <laughs> oh that's that's bully that's bully i say <laughs> bully for me <laughs> no i'm serious though right california or uh california see you got me thinking about california no seattle the chaz yeah chaz. capital like, hill autonomous Antifa zone. would name their anarchist collective country after something that sounds like you know preppy people rich white people muffy and chaz going out for a dinner at the club dear um but they're talking about they're talking about trying to become self-sustaining so they started a garden they started a garden and they did this garden by putting down one inch of dirt on top of some cardboard and sticking the plant planters in the plastic into the dirt. Oh, boy. Now, I don't know how much the audience listening knows about planting garden vegetables. But when you get them in those black planters, you must pull the plants out and kind of break the roots apart just a little bit so they'll begin to dig into the ground. If you leave them in the black planters, they'll just die. Also, if you put them in an inch of dirt on top of cardboard, they'll just die. <laughs> this, this will not feed you, okay? I, I, I'm not giving you enough to actually feed yourself, but I am telling you, these are some obvious mistakes you don't want to make. Also, chickens. This uh, member of the Chaz, uh, and I wish I could do that Northeastern, you know, snooty accent, uh, the Chaz, um, they decided that they needed more food. So what they were going to do is bring some chickens in to let it roam around on a baseball diamond. And as the person said, endless free range eggs. Endless. Hey, it's as long as it's free range, yeah. Uh, eggs, 
from a baseball diamond. Now, I will confess, I didn't know chickens ate grass. I was familiar with chicken feed. I, I just expected that chickens ate seeds and bugs and stuff. But apparently, they can eat grass itself. Fine. You know, someone pointed that out. I was making fun of these Antifa kids. They say, no, chickens can actually eat grass. I'm like, okay, that, that's fair. That was my bad. I didn't do the research. I didn't grow up on a farm. I was making fun of them. I was a little bit wrong. But then somebody else in the discussion actually went out and looked it up. The baseball field that they were going to release these chickens on. Oh, no. To graze on this grass so they could feed, so they could have endless amounts of free-range eggs isn't grass. It's not coming. It's AstroTurf. You have to, and they had a picture of it in this newspaper. He found the newspaper article talking about them putting in this AstroTurf. It's green plastic, false grass on top of cork board, on top of a liner, on top of a thick piece of articulated shaped plastic with kind of cleats that dig into the dirt. You have to dig down a good three inches just to hit bare dirt on this baseball field. Wow. Is it going to lay like those plastic eggs with surprises? <laughs> so, I mean, yes, it's serious. I don't want to say it's not serious, but at the same time, this is hilarious. Oh, yeah. They oh, were yeah. going to do something with their sign. So they had a ladder and someone's going to get up on the ladder. But a scuffle broke out. And someone was hollering around, hey, is there anybody in charge in this <laughs> autonomous anarchist paradise zone? Was it happening? Um, yes, there is. <laughs> Antifa is so peaceful that they couldn't hold a dodgeball game without a fight breaking out. Oh. <laughs> Hold on. The, that you've told me everything I need to know about these people. They have a perfectly good baseball diamond available to them, and they're playing dodgeball somewhere else and using the baseball diamond for chickens. Dodgeball! Well, you can't play dodgeball where the chicken is. I mean, a ball might hit the chicken or... Someone might accidentally kick the chicken. So we, we, you can't play there. Oh, my goodness. So nobody was in charge. Okay, so so they set up this autonomous zone. They had pre-printed, they had a pre-printed sign, like painted up and lacquered on, on wood when this happens. So this clearly was planned in advance. And less than six hours after they launched this, the leader of the zone um, was kicked out because of assaults uh, against other people in the zone. And I, I, I'm trying to say this because this is a family show. Personal assaults of a personal nature, if you understand what I'm saying. Kicked out less than six hours. So all of a sudden, they didn't have a leader. Six hours into the zone. So a rapper a sound, <laughs> a sound cloud rapper who is an Airbnb super host who is the only person in the zone, him and his friends, his posse, are the only people in the zone who had guns. Oh, boy. He became the warlord of Seattle. <laughs> the warlord of the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. 
within That's a wonderful. day. 24 hours. All right. So within over. within 24 hours, they, they lost some sort of leader to assault and got a warlord and and homeless people took all their food. That that actually didn't happen. No, that was a fake tweet. But it but it sure was funny for a bit. <laughs> so uh, this is this is great. If you're wondering why <sighs> the authorities haven't really done anything about this and just sort of let them do this, you have one answer right there. <laughs> it's it's so hilariously inept. <laughs> it's guaranteed to implode. So, yeah, I just, I understand this is serious. There are really people who are living in the area who are caught into this area, but it's hilarious. This, these leftists set up an autonomous zone to be free from America. And the first thing they do is throw up border walls <laughs> and get guns. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't should really. Go ahead. And well, they really they, they by... franchised the operation. Oh, really? They've got two franchises going right now, one in Portland and one in Chicago. I just got an update before the show. There was a Nashville franchise that people apparently weren't having any of, and so they just shut that right down in Nashville. So uh, unsuccessful franchise attempt at Nashville. So they were building the wall uh, in Portland, and, and they stole a bunch of fences from the Portland city. So they set up an autonomous nation in Portland, and they built the wall, and Portland paid for it. Nah. See, the one in Seattle needs to choose a less confusing name because the first one I saw, okay, it's the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, and it's in Washington. I nearly thought, oh, is this in D.C.? <laughs> <laughs> Did someone actually cordon off Capitol Hill and like Lindsey Graham and Nancy Pelosi are now behind like barbed wire or something? Well, th that's funny, but you know why they chose that name, right? No, I have no idea. Oh, Capitol Hill is uh, infamous or famous, if you prefer. In in Seattle, it's it's a it, it's a happening neighborhood. Uh, when you say, "Hey, I'm in Cap Hill," that uh, probably means you're gay. It's it's where all of the crazy leftists and uh, the big gay community live in Seattle. It's the leftist of the left, and so the fact that they actually did this makes perfect sense. Well, thanks for explaining. But so is. Is Cap Hill in Seattle named after the one in D.C.? Because I know the state of Washington is also named after George Washington. So is that intentional? Or? No, no. Cap Hill, I, I, I think literally the Capitol building is there. It's, oh, okay. uh, Capitol Hill with an O-L, uh, which, which is, makes this whole thing hilarious because the mayor's just sort of been letting it happen. And, uh, oh, she's not saying it's always been autonomous. Oh, <laughs> You know what? This might not even be enough for Seattle to uh, throw out its government, but it, they've got a, they've got a really really bad government, and I don't mind saying that. There's there's a, a famous video clip of a city council meeting where where the residents are are threatening to vote them out, and they're just smugly smiling at all the their constituents. It's, it's Seattle is something special, guys. It's <laughs> Seattle, Seattle special. It's bloody so, magic. Anyway, my point <laughs> is that people listening to this show in the future, when you ask what happened to Western civilization, all I can do is point you to this one example in Seattle. It's been up for like a week. We've been laughing at it because even though it's serious, I mean, what else are we supposed to do? It's like it's like the most inept thing I've ever seen. It, it's uh, these are these are the Keystone cops. Oh yeah, uh, violent revolutionaries, and so we don't know what's going on either. We're just kind of laughing at these idiots, 
because that's all we can do. I don't know um, what we're supposed to do. I know what we can do, though. Say I told you so. All right. Oh, yeah. But, someone was, like, nagging us about that. So Someone on the right was saying, hey, you know, all these people who are coming over and joining our side now that they've seen Antifa and, and stuff, you can't tell them I told you so. And I'm like, what? We can't tell them I told you so. That's the best part. <laughs> um, yeah. But anyways, uh, to back away from politics, I didn't mean to get so political there. It's just, that's been hilarious. I've been it's laughing hilarious. and laughing. Um, well, we've bent the show rules here and there when appropriate. You know, it's 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 the European law model, right? Where you have a, a few big laws and you enforce them with some leeway. And like the American system where we have lots of little laws and we fall them all to the letter. Or we used to. But uh, so you're, you're allowed. Um, Worth it. Yeah. So, uh, Dornal, how was your week? Uh, besides laughing at the at the chaz, my week's been good. <laughs> my week's been good. I was just I was just explaining before the show. I uh, last week we missed the show because I went to a cousin's wedding. It was beautiful. There's a it was a, a first of all it was on the other side of the country, so it was like a seven hour flight followed by twelve hours in a hotel bed followed by a beautiful wedding and reception followed by another 12 hours in a hotel bed, followed by another seven hours flight home, which is, I guess that's, I guess that's a vacation. I don't know. Uh, but I'm fully recharged now. It's been good. You sound like it. I forgot something. You forgot something. Oh, I have a question for you, Daddy Warpig. Yeah. What about you? How was your week? Uh, Oh, I, answered that. I, I forgot something. Minneapolis pulled the trigger on the thing. Oh, yeah? What, what thing? You know, the thing they've been arguing about all week? The police. Oh, yeah. oh are, are they are they really going to uh, abolish the police department? Yeah, the vote went through. Oh, I... <clears throat> well, this is, we're just going to find out what takes its place. It's... <laughs> <laughs> So, is it like a community public safety system or something like that? Community based policing. All right, well, no, not policing. Public this, safety. Right, yeah. This is it. We're we're full. We're a full politics and current events show today. Just deal with it. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, we're not. All right. I just so, I, I I read something really interesting that you made me think of, and this is your fault, Daddy. We're pig. Uh, so it's when, all my fault. It's always my fault. I when you told though that uh, they voted on a pledge. They didn't actually go through with it yet. Oh, okay, good. Let's let's not go through with that. And and <clears throat> Brad, you can you can just leave Minneapolis if it becomes a problem. If you know if if you no longer have any police. Um, and the reason why the reason reason why you don't have your own autonomous autonomous zone is because didn't they just burn down most of the city already? That's a tough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was mean. That's a tough spot to be in. If, yeah, if you had a, a Minneapolis autonomous zone, it would be completely indistinguishable from 500 tons of charcoal briquette. <laughs> oh, we're being cruel. Hey, <laughs> hey, Brad, we're praying for your safety. Yeah, um, but uh, but you mentioned the abolishing the police, and and I read a really interesting perspective on that, which is the. Consider how new in human civilization, how new the police are and and what their purpose is and what they really do. And, uh, and I forget who the author was. It was probably on a, on a website that'll get me uh, noticed by the FBI. But the, that was a joke, guys. The police, the effect of the police is actually to protect the criminals. Not in the sense that, oh, yeah, we're going to – not in the anarcho-tyranny sense where, hi, you know, we're going to let the criminals do what they want. But in the sense of when there are no police and people are doing the community policing, well, a lot more people just get shot, right? 
uh, or or lynched or hanged or something like that. When when the community takes care of its own and people are forced to defend their lives and their property by themselves, they don't have that overwhelming force. They don't have that authority, right? It's Wild West. So I think the people calling for the abolition of the police, I don't think they've realized just what they are going to get if if the police are truly abolished. Yeah, I keep thinking of that speech by Tim Roth from Hateful Eight to bring us back to movies where he talks about the difference between justice and frontier justice. And it's much, much as you described. Mm. Mm. And nobody's going to blame Bradford Walker for, for if he arms himself and digs a moat and sets up security cameras with automated weaponry to protect his house because they abolished his police force. Well, unfortunately, it's probably not going to work like that. Uh, the it'll work, yeah. Yeah. The way it'll probably work, considering who's in charge, is that uh, the people burning down AutoZone are going to get a stern talking to at worst or counseling. And uh, if Bradford attempted that at his house, he would have like drone strikes. So, <laughs> you know, it's true. Laugh. I laugh, but it's true. Um, that's the that's the anarcho tyranny I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Oh well, oh well. See that see what you have wrought, Daddy Warpig. Gaze upon it and be terrified. Sorry, I was I was catching up with chat during that discussion, so chat's enjoying the discussion. Thanks for everybody listening live. This is awesome. Uh and we it's, it's we we had and we had to talk about it. You know, it's on the top of everyone's mind. Crazy stuff is happening. Um also, apparently, we've re we've repealed the virus or something. Did, did I miss? Am I misunderstanding oh, that? Repealed the virus? Hang on, we we could have just voted on it. Uh, apparently, the doctors, the politicians, and the journalists voted, and they repealed the virus, so it's not a threat anymore. We can go in big crowds, and it's no big. Right. Yeah, but only only if you're protesting injustice. Not oh okay. You, you can't you can't have parties. You can't have weddings. You can't have oh, you can't you can't go to church. Uh, this is but, the most hilarious thing ever. These little oh. Jewish kids in New York, <laughs> they have some specific church function that's just for Jewish kids, and you know, De, De Blasio kept on shutting up. Man, man, so many freaking current events. De Blasio kept shutting them down. And so they turned it into a Black Lives Matter rally. They put up a couple of Black Lives Matter signs, and and, and they they just did it, and nobody touched them. That's, they just did the same thing they were gonna do with Black Lives Matter signs, and they got away with it. That's the kind of uh, that's the kind of cynical. <laughs> maneuvering uh, that's I, it's killing me that's so funny <laughs> well and just... save some of that laughter for in uh two to four weeks when the first wave of of riders that were out there in close proximity not social distancing and without masks uh have pneumonia <laughs> oh yeah because you know they're not going to blame it on that like they'll right. uh I, what's gonna be funny because i don't wish illness on or suffering on anyone but the press attempting to either memory hold that or spin it to not be a, a, about their own bad advice or the protesters lack of prudence will, will be hilarious it'll be hilarious to see what they come up with to explain why these guys are hacking up along <laughs> matthew martin in the chat is saying that was a battle on b article uh, i bet it was I oh, bet it was. Bad. Oh, I'm I'm disappointed now. My life has worsened. I was so excited. I was so proud of those kids. <laughs> they were some of my new heroes, man. Uh well but, but I think the the Babylon B what I mean, what's the, what's the word for they're the they're the ultimate. They're the of all the onion style parodies, of course, the onion is is the first and the best. But the Babylon Bee 
almost always hits. All of those headlines are hilarious. Yeah. That, that's because the Onion just got too scared to do really edgy stuff. Yeah, yeah. I... <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember a couple of their really good ones that uh, they don't they don't do that same, they don't do as much anymore. So, Brian, All right. <laughs> yeah, speaking well, of abrupt transitions to completely different topics, welcome back, man. Thanks, thanks for having me. I've, I've had a terrific week. <laughs> you oh, guys. you asked me how my week was. Yeah, yeah. want to get into Ish. that. No, like, I don't have big long stories. I've been working really, really hard. Got a lot of stuff done. I'm very excited. That's I like it. that. That's good the, enough. The Babylon B is racing Poe's Law at light speed. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, they've had some articles that they published this last week that were literally um, obviated by the end of the day. <laughs> uh, like they talked about uh, McGruff the Crime Dog. Uh, being put down because <laughs> uh, he was a police dog and, and you know, that was bad. And then just after that, we find out that Paw Patrol, the cartoon for kids, <laughs> they were trying to get it canceled because it depicted police positively. My In goodness. real life, that really happened. Well, wow. they're the cops now. And like yeah, a, you, you're not. Other, there's there's a big movement to cancel all cop shows or any shows that depict policemen behaving positively. Yeah, and I don't think that that particular cultural shift is getting the attention it deserves because now we're all movie buffs. That's why we're here. The like the the lone hero, rugged individual cop, has been an American cultural icon. For decades, it goes back to the white hat sheriff in two fisted westerns, right? Or as recently as like John McClain or Riggs and Murtaugh, right? I mean, uh, the 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 cop bucking the system and fighting for justice has been an American hero for our whole lives, and uh, they just overturned that by fiat. Mm. Think about that. Yeah. So that's the Babylon Bee made up something about McGruff the crime dog, and it was literally passed up by reality in, you know, just like that. Yeah, yeah I, you uh, know what? It would be a great. It would be a great meta episode for uh, Law and Order Special Victims Use It Unit to have its final episode be about this issue. <laughs> but yeah, it's a it's a new iconoclasm. That, that's what's going on. <laughs> well, so, anyways, city, yeah, the city council well, voted new. and disbanded. The end. <laughs> Cavil banging sound. Dun dun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, sorry for that that extra di digression. That's that was the chat's fault. I I blame <laughs> I blame chat. The uh. Anyway, Brian Niemeyer, you are back, and you've been having a great week because, I, as I understand it, you have a fund, crowdfunding campaign for your new book, and it is going very well. Yeah, it's uh, at number one. It is the most successful campaign that we've run yet, and it beat the previous campaign for CY 42nd coming in half the time. So we're halfway through and uh, it's already surpassed the previous campaign, but we're still going where there, there are no breaks. We're riding this thing all the way to wherever it's going to take us. I am continually coming up with new stretch goals and new perks. One of which John, you can tell us about because one of them is an additional chance to play test the official combat frame exceed card game. Oh yeah, I wasn't expecting that to go public so soon. That was uh, uh, that's an interesting perk right there. Uh, what can I say? Um, this is normally this is normally a thing that we have the guests uh, talk about, but I'm going to talk about it. 
Um, Brian, you've got and, and full disclosure, I have backed this campaign and the other the other campaigns uh, because because I'm a I'm a firm, firm believer in uh, your work. But I, I backed. Yes. Thank you. D -W, DW, when are you building a mech? <laughs> You don't. You uh, can even be lazy about it. You can just. Can you make a big mech that looks like a giant war pig? I was gonna say that, <laughs> but I was afraid to. <laughs> I'll make you a war pig. There's one left. There's one build a mech left. Chat, just one. It's, it's a race. We can build the last mech. Um, and and you've talked about this on the show. Going back to to your question, I feel like I'm being interviewed now. Uh, you've got these tie-in, I'm going to say tie-in games, but when we talk about, you know, hey, how do these mechs work, and how do you envision the fights, and, and how do you envision these wonderful battles, and, and you've said, I think on the show even, we I just get together with my friends and we game it out. We literally do it like a war game <laughs> with, with, with these <laughs> custom rules. Uh, and that's great. And, and so you're taking those custom rules and uh, and you're developing them further into a, into a tabletop game to share, and you've also enlisted uh, the Anons, uh, Cardanon, uh, to create a trading card game. With those, and of course, uh, uh, really quick, gotta stop and give a shout out to my awesome concept artist Ardanon, who's in chat. Yeah, because I'm in the the mix for the cards. Yeah, because yeah, Cardanon, Cardanon actually. Uh, yeah, he came to me with uh, the alpha version of the rules. He's like, hey, I think uh, th this could have legs. I think this would really suit your universe well. So shout out to Cardinon as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. I think I know who he is, but I, I can't say because he's Cardinon. Yeah. Anyway, uh, this, is, uh, this is cool. This is some cool stuff. Uh, I think you guys are, and and the more people that get involved in that project, the the better it's going to be because the the rules, and I've seen a very early version of the rules. The rules have legs. It it works for the the universe. It could be a compelling game. Let's mm, let's uh, let's make that happen because I think on top of on top of it just being fun. It's a great idea for for your kind of setting and and property, for lack of a better word, has those cool tie-ins. Yeah, no, you're right. They're they're totally tie-ins. Um, I, as an author, my artistic goal is to get my work in front of as many eyeballs as possible, in whatever form I can. And what's accessible to me at this point is games. So we had the playtesting slots for the tabletop RPG last time. Uh, I, I think that the playtests for that are going great. We've been doing that on roll 20. Um, and so now we've got the, the card game, uh, which uh, we've really spent like the last year playtesting and refining from the initial rule set. And uh, in addition to you, I brought in some really hard hitting cardboard crack addicts, some old school, Magic the Gathering in, in Yu-Gi-Oh and like Netrunner types who are just doing everything, everything they can to break the game, give us notes for how they did it. Then we come back with a new iteration. They break the game again and you just keep repeating, man. That's uh, that's how it goes. It's good, clean, wholesome, fun. And we're inviting you to be a part of it now. Help us, awesome. uh, help us try to find those and break this thing. It's and, and have fun doing it. Uh, it's cool. Hey, have you had much support for it yet, or, or is this brand new announcement? This is a brand new announcement. Uh, we are. Let's see, we're having openings for. I don't want to say this wrong and get people's hopes up, only to be dashed. Okay, yeah, there are five seats at the playtesting table open right now. Uh, the price for that per tier is $200, but you don't just get the playtesting, and that's for multiple playtesting sessions. You get the current rules, and you get every card in the game in digital format. Okay. Yeah, and you get 
every ebook in the series. So the entire original series of three ebooks, plus you're going to get the new one when it comes out. Plus you get the new series of trading cards that you guys voted on. Oh, the pay Oh, you also get a signed paperback version of Combat Frame X Seed S. So you get everything that is now available. Uh, if it is anything like the RPG play testing slots from last time, when people find out about it and get a hold of it, it's going to go fast. So I do recommend getting your foot in the door now if you would like to play and uh, become part of the history of the game, help shape the game. That sounds great. I actually have a question about the how you're going to execute the playtesting. Have you worked out the technical details yet? Yeah, we've, we've actually done it. Uh, what we do is you, you just uh, get your webcam out and we just teleconference over Discord. We've uh, done it before and it worked really well. Perfect. Yep. Uh, so, oh, so it's a, it's a print and play thing. Yeah. And what you're, right. you're going to do is I will send you the digital copies of all, all the cards and they come in like pre-sized sheets and you get three copies of every card per sheet because that's uh, under the current rules, the, the most number uh, of copies of a particular card you can have in your deck at a time. Mm -hmm. And then you just pick the ones you want. You make a deck of, I think 40 is like the ideal number and print them out. doesn't have to be fancy. You can use like a black and white toner printer to uh, save on ink. And then uh, what I do is I take cards from other games or even just playing cards. And then I get like a, a pack of those plastic deck protector sleeves. Oh yeah. And just put the, uh, the card from the other game in there and then put the paper printout of the X seed cards on top of it. And it works great. Oh yeah. That's yeah. That's a great technique common for proxying, uh, cards in other CCGs. Yeah, if, I figure if you're interested in playtesting this game, you've got those materials on hand. But uh, yeah, you know, if I, I'm willing to make a deal, if you need like some of those uh, deck protectors, I've got some. They weigh less than like a slice of bread, so I'll I'll, I'll send you a pack. It's no big deal. <laughs> yeah, I'm only meeting halfway. Um, Matthew Martin in chat has an interesting question for you. Are you using an existing open system or bespoke system for your role-playing game? This is new. Ooh. Cardinon came up with the, uh, the initial idea and uh, is actively involved in the, the updates that the uh, playtesters come up with. Uh, so it's really been refined in fire. I think we're uh, really honing this system with a razor edge. It's really exciting to watch. Oh yeah, I haven't I haven't uh, looked at the rules in a long time. I'm really excited to see the how they've changed. Uh, Martin's question was about the uh, tabletop game RPG. About that's the tabletop RPG. Yeah, that's a custom system, right? Yep, that is a custom system that uh, me and a buddy came up with. Uh, gosh, seventeen years ago now. Oh yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, and full disclosure, I've done a little play testing of that as well. Uh, you'll you'll f for for those of you who are into RPG design, it is a skills based system using d sixes. So that's uh that should give you a general idea of what you're getting into. Yep, and the system that uh, we're playing in is the one I used to game out my book outlines. <laughs> well, that means that, you know, that means that we need a character sheet for all the build of mech mechs, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, that yeah. Could easily be done, yeah. Well, I mean, that's that. That's really all I have to say about that stuff. I love, I love gaming. You guys know that. And uh, I've enjoyed my my press peek into the systems that you guys are designing. Uh, I still think build a mech is, is the business. It's, it's such a good, uh, I recommend everybody do it just for the experience. It is, it is fun and rewarding to sit down with the author, 
throw around some ideas, come up with a design. And once the design gels and you start getting some sketches back from Ardenon, then it sort of, it really firms up in your mind. And then ultimately you get to read it, get blown up in the book. <laughs> now, I can't You're... promise you, I I can't promise you that uh, your build a mech will take on half of the mechs on the cover and win, but you know, you can try. <laughs> Something to aspire to. Yeah, and it, or no, it says collaborative effort. Yeah, that that's a value I try to bring to the table because I'm a, a smaller indie operation. I go for the personal touch. So I work one on one with my readers, with my backers to realize their vision. Because if it's not fun for them, what's the point? Right? I'm here to bring you fun. And I don't know, ask anybody. I think I succeed. Well, I think so. And and those of us who did the first Build a Mech campaign have come back for for each successive campaign. Um, I just did it. Uh, I just did it the first time on a lark. I think while we were doing the show, and you were talking about it, I was like, "Eh, sure, let me give this a try." Uh, and it was a ton of fun. A ton of fun. Uh, switching back, I, I think there's a delay in the chat here in Streamyard, uh, which is why we keep sort of bouncing back and forth. But uh, Rawl has a question uh, in the card game: Will there eventually be non exceed mechs? Um, I, I don't think. He, I don't think he means necessarily the X seed, but because of, of course the the Grand Dolphs and the Grenzies and whatnot, they're all in there. But uh, can you answer his question? Let's see. Well, there eventually be non X seed series. So just to clarify, uh, yeah, like John was saying, there are already mecha in the card game that um, are not X seed class combat frames. So yeah, we have like the. Grandsmark series, the Dolph series. We have the custom ones. Uh, we have some of the build. We're gonna have some of the build mechs in there. Uh, now, I have the rights to the X Seed book series. So if you're talking about like the property, like the IP itself, well, I own that intellectual property, so I can make cards of it. If I wanted to do, say, like if you're talking about Robotech or Battletech or Gundam. I would have to license those. And uh, right now, I don't really see the percentage in it since this is an Xseed tie-in card game. So, I mean, that, that would be like, uh, you know, the, the the Gundam Wing collectible card game licensing Mech Warrior mechs or something, which might be interesting for a crossover. You might get like a Dynasty Warriors Gundam thing then. I don't know. But... Uh, uh, one of the main reasons that I wrote comment for Mech Seed was in my artistic estimation, the, the big mech franchises have largely gone astray and stopped laser focusing on bringing their audiences fun. So I don't really need them <laughs> is I suppose the overall answer. Like I'm having enough fun with my mechs and the mechs we're building together. Cool. Ready proof. Well, if I mean, build back, it'll probably end up in the in the game eventually. Probably, we hope. A, a man can dream. Mm. Well, actually, no. I I don't think you should put my build a mechs in the card game. I think that would be unfair. <laughs> you might as well you might as well put it directly onto the banned list. We can do that. <laughs> Play an all banned game. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Core first versus Reaper versus yeah yeah go on. Um, which is uh, uh, that's part of the fun too. I have a, I have an interesting question. I uh, I had a shower thought today. Um, and Daddy Warpig, we'll get to your question in a second. Um, uh, <laughs> that was a joke. I'm messing with you, man. <laughs> oh, I like, wait, I had a question. Has it been that long? I mean, it's happened. I've asked the question and forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're still here. 
I really <laughs> seriously don't remember asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, it's, it's mean of me. I know Daddy Warpig's uh, feeling a little under the weather today, so I'm taking advantage of his, his situation and poking fun. But it's all in fun. I had a shower thought today about the, the build a mech thing, which is there's only, you know, five or six of us who did the build a mech. And for me, as a, when I read the book and I get to that part where the mech is introduced, I recognize it and I go, oh, that's cool. And, and in both cases, two for two so far, I was really excited about the scene. You really brought the mech to life. You, the things that we talked about that were not necessarily physical characteristics, sort of the, the situations and behaviors, you were able to bring that to life. And so it was really enjoyable for me. But I'm the guy who paid for it. You obviously have quite a few readers at this point. What are, what's the response, if any, from the other readers who haven't, who aren't, don't have an, anything, any emotional investment into those characters? Well, let's draw it over to Amazon, shall we? So the the book you're talking about, the previous book. CY 42nd coming has a 4.8 out of five star rating right now. Uh -huh. So I, I think people are liking all the mechs. Good. I haven't had any complaints. Uh, but when I do polls for which uh, trading card, for which mechs are going to be on the new series of, of trading card, uh, you, you've seen, I've included a lot of the BAMs and uh, they, they've got their fans. They, they Good. Do well. So I mean, uh, Kerr first made it into a uh, which was uh, from one of our first rounds of build a made it into the previous series of cards. So yeah, there, there's been a big and overwhelmingly positive response. And I, I got to say for yours, one reason that I am able to integrate it so smoothly into the story is because your descriptions are so vivid and you're really clear in detail and communicating, not just how you want a mech to look, but how you want your mechs to behave. Oh, I see. I see. Well, that's good advice for anybody interested in doing the build a mech. Uh, don't if if you talk to Brian about here's where I think this mech might fit into some sort of narrative or story, or a, here's how I think this mech would be most useful in a combat situation. You'll use that. You'll you'll or, or at least you'll you'll take it into consideration, and and it'll feel natural. Oh, totally. Like with uh, Reaper, you said, okay, I want this thing to be a wrecking ball. I want it to just scream in from out of nowhere, disrupt the whole scene and just scatter enemy formations, but then have like some close to medium range weaponry where it can, it can do a lot of damage, but it can also extricate itself before the enemy can really strike back. So I'm like, okay, I, I can totally see how that would play out. Oh, uh, well, it worked. Good. Glad it worked. Yeah, it totally worked. Uh, this is this is definitely the 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 Niemeyer fan hour. Um <laughs> well, just because just because we've been we've been hanging out forever now and and sort of DW and I have have been with you on this on this journey from, you know, starting off trying to, you know, being a professional writer to having this series going and so it's Sci-fi, sci-fi, yeah. sci-fi journal, uh, and so it's it's great it, it's great to see it's great to see evidence you know the the proof that your hard work is paying off and that uh, both in terms of successful crowdfund and um, your craft where you can take some fans idea and package it up and make it part of your narrative that's why and i keep i keep gushing on uh, about the build a mech perk it's a great thing to do for your fans and i hope more people take advantage of it thanks because speaking of tie-ins i i don't mind revealing that my my deepest desires right my <laughs> In the most secret cockles of my heart, I have always envisioned combat frame X seed as like 
a high nineties Bandai Sunrise painted on cell, like one of the last cell painted anime mech series, right? Mm. Something that would be on like the original run of Toonami, right? Yep. And I've actually had folks in in the chat, like uh, like Roll and Impreb, ask me, "Well, would you ever do an anime or just like a get a pilot episode produced or something, or even okay, if not that, what what about doing a manga, right? What about uh, you know getting together with your buddy John Delrose, the the leading Hispanic voice in comics, and uh, crowdfunding up a." Uh, Comic Frame X Seed manga issue. And the reason that I work in print novels in, in prose is it's an art form with some of the lowest production costs up front imaginable, really low overhead. So yeah, I, even though it's uh it's a record setting amount, four figures, like I've raised now, is is plenty to fund everything we've done so far. But another great thing about crowdfunding is it's a good barometer of public interest. So if we can hit the 10K mark on this sucker, that's going to tell me a couple things. And one thing it's going to tell me is that there's sufficient public interest to justify exploring turning this into a manga or possibly even looking into some forms of indie animation to like, Get, get at least, you know, a short made, a, a short animated feature or something. So oh, that'd be great. Okay, that's what I was hoping you'd say. Because again, I only know what you, the the fans, tell me. So if you guys out there want to see Comet from Exceed make the jump and be adapted into a more visual medium, then what I would say is get another vote with your wallet and let's get this campaign to the 10k mark because i'll be allowed and clear message that okay there's some juice here this has legs this would be worthwhile getting like a a, a mangaka or an animation expert and hiring someone to actually do uh do a comic do a short animated short we'll, we'll see where it takes us we'll see what the pricing is yeah, like Art Nan is saying, a comic strip possibly collected into a graphic novel. Yeah. Well, I I hope so. That uh, that's that's where your dreams are, and I hope that you can attain them. I hope I hope that the audience is yeah. is willing to to take us on this wonderful journey. I mean, I'm getting really corny here for a second. Somebody save me. Uh. Apparently, all I've got on the mind are current events, man. It's been that kind of week. <laughs> it yeah, really, kind of it really has. It really has. Well, oh, oh I can I'm kind of disappointed now. <laughs> Chuck Wendig, there you go. There, there's your life <laughs> Grab that. Oh, you yeah. know, we were going to talk about that, but you know, I didn't want to override your book, man. I was trying to get to your book all during the first half of the show, and we kept on getting dragged back into the black vortex that was the hilarity of Seattle. Well, I think we need a chaser now because we I've been gushing about my book for quite a while at length here. So yeah, that's that's uh, great. Plus plus you you thought of the perfect pitch, man. Just get us to 10k and we'll make a anime. That's to to rephrase what you said, that's A JD Cowan, I wonder what Build a Mech, the rapper warlord from Chaz would come up with. I don't know, man. The Razmic, oh. the the Razmic 2000. I might have to ask him. <laughs> He's a blue check on Twitter. You can just He's you a can blue just check on, Twitter. check on Twitter. I would I would do a build mech with him. <laughs> just just DM him link to the Indiegogo campaign. He he'll probably steal two hundred bucks from some poor communist in seattle and well, it's not stealing it's taxation no taxation <laughs> is a warlord he's um, good for it <laughs> of course he's 
Kershi's going to be really pissed when he realizes that we were just talking about a book and you're not actually building a mech for him. <laughs> well, uh, if we can get to a million, <laughs> I, I, I just planned out. Well, this is a this is a great business opportunity. Actually, building combat frame fighting robots for uh, anarchist warlords in War Torn USA. This is <laughs> now. This is the dark future I signed up for. <laughs> well, it, it is because he, here's the, the other thing about combat frame vaccine. It has proven to be downright prophetic this week. Okay? <laughs> everything in the backstory of the the novel so far it, is lining up with the uh, with our timeline. So yeah, you, you have widespread societal disorder bordering on collapse. And now what do we have? We have Elon Musk going largely uh, unnoticed, unfortunately doing private space launches. Okay. There are guys in space right now. That was a great oh. launch. Yeah. We talked about that last show. So glad to see it went off. They arrived on the space station um, safely. Uh, me and me and John watched it after the show. Good. Oh, and that was great. Yeah, and it's being done by SpaceX, which was the yeah. inspiration for Xseed. That, that's where I derived the name. Oh, learned something new today. Yeah, because I was specifically thinking, I need something that sounds kind of corporate research focus group, but also pretty slick, right? Yeah. And the, the coalition in the Comet Frame Xseed universe is a direct descendant of all these big tech megacorps who in uh, not, not too long in the, the, in the book's timeline, not too long from now, abandon the chaos on earth for man-made space colonies. Which, yeah, it, which perfectly mirrors that, that cross cut image of the two astronauts blasting off for the space station while Minneapolis burns. <laughs> Yeah, that's what they that's what they do. That, that's what Musk and, and Gates and Cook and, and the bees and all their buddies do in my timeline. Is they flare the and even some people uh meeting it on Twitter like, oh Elon Musk is uh planning his escape. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Need to get off need to get off this rock with all you crazy people. Yeah. I, I've I had that I've had that out open on my Twitter for a long time. Mm. <laughs> In fact, I I've Twitter, I uh, tweeted that out just last week. I'm like, any planet, literally any other planet, <laughs> I'm out of here. It's, I mean, I don't know what we expect to find on Mars or anything like that. I'm sure it's probably going to be boring up there. Uh, Fianowal says uh, Wendig is protected his account now, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> when. When dig? Oh, let's. Are, are we gonna are we gonna dig on other writers now? What's uh, what is what is a Chuck Wendig and what is going on, guys? Someone summarize this for me. Well, uh, Chuck, Chuck was the guy who wrote Twitter. one of the worst Star Trek Star Wars novels ever. I don't yeah. think we have enough time to go into it, but man, it was awful. Yeah, which is why I don't consider this ragging on another author because he he's not. <laughs> oh, I I approve. I mean, he he wasn't just awful uh, in a big sense. Like he created characters were bad who were bad, or he had big plot problems, or you know he needed to work with an editor to shape the story. All that was true, but that wasn't just it. His word choices were terrible, just horrendously bad. And uh, he, he, he's a bad writer. He's terrible. He's awful. Yeah, and, this is uh, guy. yeah go ahead. Go ahead finish before the show, I, I shared a link with... Oh, my goodness. With John and Brian. Uh, somebody posted this on Twitter. Oh, I can't. Um, I keep reading it over and over again, and it just it gets worse every time I look at it. Can't unread it. Uh. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm sick enough to know that I'll forget it, <laughs> so I'm cool with that. I, I'm trying to figure out whether I should read all of it, or, or can I find the one thing that really stands out just to let you give you a taste of what is wrong with this guy? And no, I think the first... 
I think the first paragraph is just perfect. Oh, all right. Let's 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 do this. This is here's a peek into the mind of Chuck Wendig. Two masterpiece theater music. I like to think of myself as something of a pop culture examiner. I like to sift through its dust and detritus and see what shiny baubles or squirming beetles my fingers can find. And really, what's more pop culture than porn? Because, you know, erections. See what I did there? Pop culture, erections, pop culture. Like pop goes the boner, sprung, maybe, no. That was it. That uh, that was actually a quote. That, that was the quote. This guy writes like the the most obnoxious effeminate millennial talks and instead of it, it's it's the, like the internet there's no concept of the difference between the written word and the spoken word and so he just writes as he speaks and if you heard him speak and I apologize for you having heard me read it I hope I did I hope I did the tone justice you would hate that person if someone actually con- conversed with you in that way you would roll your eyes and, and walk away or something I don't know yeah and Disney knows that and that's why they handpicked him they they gave him the golden ticket to to the top of the profession they gave him Star Wars okay to humiliate us because they know I mean, this guy would be a Starbucks barista. And I, want to, I want to back up just a sec. Because I'm sorry, I like the big picture and everything, and that's all cool. But I want to talk about this article. Oh, yeah. Because this article is creepy as hell. He writes an entire article of him complaining about Porn. Oh my goodness. Wait, hang on a sec. A lot of people have a lot of good complaints about porn, but in what way do you mean that? Well, all I know is from reading this excerpt, I haven't read the whole article because I like myself. Um, I think I'm a pretty great guy and I don't deserve to suffer like that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I've gone through a lot in my life and I, I don't have to wish, uh, more pain on myself than I already have experienced. Uh, like here, I'm going to read this. I, this is Chuck. Okay. I, for instance, just had a tall frosty glass of pornography with my oatmeal and later I will receive one free porn video download straight into my nipples when I buy a venti mocha at Starbucks. What? Huh? He, he, he wrote an entire article filled with this trash. Well, it's, as, I doc, as I document and don't give money to people who hate you, my triple bestseller <clears throat> available now. Um, Wendig was also the guy who scolded Star Wars fans for hating a movie that was custom tailored for them to hate. A movie that was just current Lucasfilms contempt for its fans made Sally Lloyd, okay, and ended with Hail Satan. So that basically tells you need to know about this guy's function in the scheme of things. Wow. All I'm saying is don't give money to people who are obviously broken inside and are just producing absolute tr- I mean, this guy, there is something wrong in his head. It's not, maybe he has actual talent somewhere in it. Maybe he has a scintilla of talent, but it's been buried under so much. Um, soy. Soy. <laughs> so all of the people 
we wait long enough and all of them turn out to have some kind of terrible addiction that they can't turn away from or haven't turned away from or haven't even tried to turn away from. And that's what they wrap their social justice around is it turns out that they have this as a way of compensating for this problem at the core of their mind and heart. Um, and this article doesn't just speak to how bad he is writing. It, it speaks to something broken and terrible inside him. Yeah, I mean, he literally calls this article Chuck Wendig, Terrible Minds. This is Chuck Wendig's. This is what I thought when I first read it. You know, O.J. Simpson wrote a book call that basically said, well, I'm not saying I did it, but if I did it, this is how I would have done it. Because, like, he feels like he wants to confess, right? This article is basically Chuck feeling like he wants to confess whatever terrible thing is inside him. Hmm. Yeah. Um, There's often down in the chat points it. out, Disney fired Chuck for issuing death threats against Republicans. Yeah. Well, I mean, they are Republicans. Doesn't that mean they're bad? <laughs> well, that's a lot of the can of worms. Yeah, that gets into breaking the show rule we bent earlier. So now, now Daddy Warpig made an interesting thought bounce around in my roomy cranium. Uh, that was the size of my brain joke. How did it land? Uh, not so good. All right. Sorry, guys. Sorry, I'm still trying to brush off the big rooms of material like that. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. I, well, the, you guys are my test bed. My my stand up career is not ready to take off yet. The so the idea that came to my head is that Brian's talking about the death cult and people who hate you, and Daddy Warpig's pointing out just how broken this guy is. And so I'm I'm a nice guy. I like to give the benefit of the doubt. I does Chuck Wendig is is he an evil or hateful person? No. It, does he do evil? Yes. How can someone raised in what's left of American civilization uh, fed a diet of high fructose corn syrup and soy and taught that it's fun and hip to talk like a character on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. How can he, he help but write like this? Has he been shown another way? I submit that he is doing evil, but he is a tool. That's my thought. Yes, they, they select for broken people like him because he's not alone. He's just a representative sample of what's going on in every industry across pop culture. And they, they seek out these uh, kinds of demon-ridden, broken artists like this. Or if they, they, they find someone who's like, who's got some talent, kind of like Bradford Walker or uh, J.D. Cowan said, and then they, then they break them. They, they, they find somebody on the edge and just push them over and turn them into their creature. Yeah, that's too bad. That's too bad. And you know what? Here's the thing, guys. If you ever notice anything that about yourself, we all do stuff like that. You can change. Buy my new self-help course. <laughs> <laughs> now see, that was a good pitch. You got a future in sales. Oh my goodness! I, it's too bad I wasn't sincere about that. I I should have had a course ready to go. It was your Gumroad link. Gumroad link. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> oh man! Now I have to tweet in in one line at a time with an extra space between each. Have you seen those tweets? Those self help guy tweets. Yeah. They're they yeah they're they're tweeting their their prose style is off putting. My my point was going to be what J D. Cowan said though. He may have a, a talent buried in him, but mm -hmm. JD Count said any creativity he had was beaten out of writer, beaten out of him by writers' workshops and old pub editor sewing circles and stuff. 
Oh, yeah. His talent is just buried under by all this other crap he has piled on on top of it. It's smothered it out. And if he could get rid of this garbage, he might actually be able to shine as a writer. And I, I, I'm not saying he would be the best writer ever in the universe, but he might actually be a good writer underneath all this crap. Maybe, but I think not. Or Really? Here's, here's what, and, and I just made this up just now so you can call bullshit on it. But you won't because I'm right. Oh. <laughs> we talked about earlier, or I, sorry, I, I pontificated about Brian's journey as a writer. And I think Chuck Wendig and people like him, the type of people who come up with the androgynous She-Ra reboot, the humiliating Thundercats reboot, the bad Star Wars fan fiction, that sort of thing. They have all the passion and excitement of a fan who, I want to do the next IP. I want to do the next property. Or I want to uh, I want to add my name to the list of people who have made this such a great cultural thing. But I think Brian's demonstrated that being a good writer is a skill. It is something that you develop. And unfortunately, there's a lot of writers with a lot of Chuck Wendig's passion whose I whose desire to be that person, to, to be that good of a writer, is crushed by writers' workshops, bad advice. People trying to play at a, at being a writer instead of actually just sitting down and doing the writing. So, I think I think Daddy Warpig, to your point, he may still have the desire to be a good writer, but he is not because he hasn't developed the skills. He doesn't have an internal locus of control. So, <laughs> when you're talking about it with your your self help pitch, you actually had. A perfectly valid point there, John, is I noticed this with a, a lot of writers, like especially the ones who uh, tweet in the am writing and like nano rhino uh, hashtags and stuff who are all about being aspiring authors, right? And they talk about, oh, what a slog it is and how depressing it is to like, oh, I just, I spent eight hours pounding away at the keyboard and then wrote and I wrote it. It's garbage. I got to start over. Those people have an external locus of control. They think, well, here's how the industry is. Here's how the world is. And there's nothing I can do to change that. I am at the mercy of the vicissitudes of the, the system of, of my environment. And they despair. They, they don't get better because they don't realize that they can't do anything to get better. The people who succeed have an internal locus of control where they think, okay, yeah, here's the world. It is how it is. But the world is made up of the individual choices of each and every one of us. And even if I can't do anything on my own to make a major impact on how the world is, I can change me, right? That's If, if I don't like how the world is, I'm going to work on myself. I'm going to do what I can with what I've got here and figure out what changes I can make to improve my quality of life and make them. And in my case, that was learning how to write and then writing and not worrying what Disney thought, not worrying what Tor thought, not worrying what HarperCollins thought, not worrying what Chuck Wendig thinks, because I don't care. Yeah. He's just a little cow I like to laugh at. That's a good point. He's got an external locus of control. That's why he's a puppet just being blown around in the wind. Hey, Chuck hey. Wendig did a how to write book. That's great. That's that's gotta be classic. What? I I don't even Oh, he um, probably you know, he probably just reiterated his creative writing workshops and sprinkled in his own opinions in there and sold it. All right, I think that that's it for me today. I think 
Oh, we've, I think that was everything. I think I've taken all I can take. We, right now. We've broken the war pig. He's ready. Stop the world. I want to get off. That's where he's at right now. <laughs> Chuck Rendig. Writers. He's a writer's writer, man. He, if you want to know what beautiful work the English language is doing, you just catch up with what he's been doing. I high recommend. Uh, no, I'm done. I'm done. We, we, <laughs> we are way over time, and, and it's been a time. lot of fun. And that's just too much mental damage for me to sustain for one day. That's right. You, fail, you failed your sanity check. You're out. <laughs> I don't have to take that. I read his writing. I don't have to deal with that concept of him having a pit. What? He has a writer's advice store source book. I'm trying to think. I know what he could write. He, he could write. I could think of examples, but seriously, that's like that's like Michael Myers, you know. <laughs> Writing a guidebook on how to be a good babysitter, or <laughs> yeah, Tr Tr Michael Myers trick or treating Halloween safety guide. Yeah, it just it does not compute. Sorry, man. Uh, that's it. They Kirk me. I submit to you that you are illogical. And now my brain is frying itself trying to reconcile the paradox. Okay, we know what Wendy can write now. He can write the flavor text for Call of Cthulhu books where they need swatches of like those arcane tomes or the, the <laughs> jibberings of asylum inmates. <laughs> See, we, we found a place for him. See, you find out, find out what you're good at, get paid for it. <laughs> Buy my self help book. <laughs> <laughs> I want to book on writing and do the exact opposite of everything he says. Uh, yeah. Do you have any, any last words, Brian? Yes. The campaign link is in the show notes. Go mash that sucker. Claim your sweet perks, including the build back. Claim your spot at our gaming table for the card game. I'm available for editing. To make sure that you authors out there don't end up like Chuck Windig. Don't don't go out there without an editor. Don't go out there alone without a safety net. That way lies madness. Get me to help you make your book the best it can be. There's one build back There's one pro editing perk left. There are plenty of seats at the table, but again, when people find out about it, they're going to go fast. So claim your sweet perks. Support any science fiction. Get us to 10K. 10K to anime. Remember that. 10K to the anime. All right, peace, I'm out. Yes. Mic dropped. Uh, for my part, uh, it's been a pleasure having you back on. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'd like to thank my inimitable co-host, as always, Daddy Warpig, uh, everybody listening later, and hanging out in the chat today. Chat was a lot of fun today. It was great talking with you guys about all the crazy stuff that's going on in this world and in our imaginations. So uh, it's been a great geek, Eb. And I'm done for today. All right. Um, next week, we have Shell Presto and Mike DiBaggio scheduled to come on the show. Uh, they'll be talking about the project they're working on. And the week after that, um, we have Rick Stump. That's the 27th, the 20th, and the 27th coming on. Um and Rick Stomp will be talking about his uh, OSR D and D stuff, and uh, Shell Presto and Mike DiBaggio will be having. Uh, if it's not already running now, they will be having a crowdfunding uh, book coming on, which uh, I'm keeping secret for right now. But the, they talked with me about it. Art Anon in the chat um, introduced me to both. Uh, to all three of those guys so we could have them come on the show so they are scheduled for the next two weeks we have scheduled people uh almost like we're a real production <laughs> so uh, we've got some great guests coming on 
um, people I've uh, talked with online, some of which we've had on the show before, some of, which, some of whom we haven't. Uh, so we're looking forward to those uh, shows. I want to thank Brian for coming on. I want to thank everybody who jumped into the show and uh, or jumped into the chat and participated and uh, listened to the show. We want to thank everybody who's going to be listening later. Uh, and, of course, to thank my illustrious co-host, uh, Doranal, a.k.a. John here. Um, folks, we're on our way out. We are leaving you today. We are signing off. But don't you worry. Don't you fret. We will be back.